Hi there, I'm Jeff Rensick. I'm the wireless instructor over at IP Expert. And in today's video lecture, we're going to be talking about controller high availability and the access point failover process. So, uh, the high level topics that's going to be encompassed with this video lecture then is going to be what is high availability with wireless LAN controllers and what are the different high availability options and models we have to work with in the wireless world. When we have APs join a controller, how can we advertise other controllers for those APs to fail over to? What methods do we have for that? Third, um, how can we make those APs fail over in somewhat of a deterministic fashion as opposed to more of a random fashion of failover? And then throwing on top of those core things, we'll throw in some extra options and features um, on top of the core failover and high availability uh, features of the controllers. So to kind of set a scope around um, the feature set and things that we're going to be talking about, um, for our purposes today, high availability equals controller redundancy. Now there are other things that can be considered high availability. For instance, HREP or FlexConnect APs operating with local switching and local authentication, they can survive an outage of a controller and continue to serve clients. So that is high availability uh, in itself. But for our purposes of this conversation, it's going to be controller redundancy is high availability. Uh, the other thing was we're going to be um, specifically showing you uh, code level 70116 so as I'm demonstrating a lot of these HA features. That's the code we're at, uh, or you might hear it referred to as 70MR1. Um, I'm kind of locked into that because we are a certification focused company. The CCIE, the CCNP wireless, um, CCNA wireless, they're all using that code level. Um, so that's what we're going to be showing you. Uh, but I will talk about what we do have also available today in newer code as well. I just won't be able to show you that stuff. So with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and start talking about uh, HA models that we have available to us. Okay, so with redundancy models, I guess we have, I guess, probably four main models of redundancy. So, um, as we talk about redundancy, basically what we're saying is um, if an AP is associated up to a wireless LAN controller and that controller goes away, we want to have that AP move over to a different wireless LAN controller as opposed to just sitting there and twiddling its thumbs until, you know, someday that original controller comes up. So we want to have uh, the AP move over to some other controller and continue to serve clients in the meantime until we get that original controller back online. So in order to have that work, we're going to need more than one controller. All right, so redundancy models. The first one that we have that we'll talk about is high availability pairing. Now this is a newer feature and this is one thing that I won't be able to show you in action today. But with this is we actually have two controllers that operate in an active standby pairing. So if I were to draw this, this is something that was originally brought out in 7.3 code, if I remember right. We'll have one active controller and one controller that's in a standby. But it's a hot standby, so typically um, these guys would be probably plugging into two different switches for physical redundancy sake on the switching side. And they actually do have a physical connection uh, directly between them, either directly between them, um, you know, no switches in between. Newer code actually allows for, uh, you know, it tr this um, standby, uh, this uh, hot standby connection to actually traverse switches. Uh, it just depends on what code that you're in. But they do have a, a cable directly connecting the two. And this is using that little, or I guess never used pretty much, I believe it's the RP port, you know, it's the port that's been sitting there that no one used for forever on these 5500s. Now they're using them. So what's happening here is that the active controller uh, is basically has all of the APs associated up to it. So I have AP down here. It's formed a cap wap tunnel up to the active controller. And the active controller is telling the standby controller all the time, you know, okay, what are my client sessions? What are my APs joined up to me? All the information uh, that the standby would need to take over. So in the event that the active fails, the standby is going to take over 
And it's going to take over actually everything. It's going to take over um, you know, IPs. So basically what happens is this AP had a CAPWAP tunnel terminated to an AP manager on the active controller. Well, now the standby controller just takes over the IP address of that AP manager. So from the AP's perspective, its tunnel is just flowing over here, but the tunnel stays up because it's still sending to the same IP address that it was. You know, from a switch standpoint, it just looks like the MAC address for that IP address moved from over here to switch number two. So nothing really changes. The AP never drops its association. Depending on the code, um, clients may either have to re-authenticate um, re themselves. Originally, that was the way. I believe in newer code, the, the clients don't even need to re-authenticate themselves. So very great in terms of a user experience. You know, the AP is never dropped. The clients never drop. They may have to re-authenticate themselves, uh, just depending on code. Uh, but from a client perspective, you know, it's great. Uh, outages are extremely minimal. Maybe they lost a couple packets. That was probably about it. So very great in terms of a user experience. Now, the downside is these do have to be deployed in pairs. So if I needed three controllers to support all of the APs in my environment, I would have to buy three standby controllers. Now, at least the good news about buying those standby controllers, Cisco does uh, allow you to buy a high availability skewed controller. So if I had three 5508s, that have 500 licenses on them. I wouldn't have to buy three more 5508s with 500 licenses. I would have to buy three 5508s with the HA SKU, which are close, priced closer, I believe, to like a 25 license 5508. So I don't have to buy extra licenses that I don't need anymore, um, which is great. So uh, very excellent uh, method for high availability. Um, very little, if any, notice from the clients when things go wrong. Um, so a great option, but only available in newer code, as well as um, only specific controller models. For instance, I couldn't do this on 2500. I can do this on a 5500 or 7500. Just check documentation release notes to see, you know, which controllers uh, this feature is available on. So that's number one, great option, HA pairing. But let's go ahead and get into more of the classic redundancy models uh, that we've used in the past. Number two. N plus one. And the end part is just however many controllers you need to support your APs. And then the plus one is I have one controller just sitting off on its own, not doing anything, waiting for one of these N controllers to fail. So in this model, I might, let's say I had three controllers, WLC one, and these are supporting all the access points in my environment. And then I just have WLC4 sitting over here. You know, we have this cloud of APs all using controllers 1, 2, and 3. Controller 4 is just sitting off on its own, just waiting. So with this, if controller 2 goes away for whatever reason, all the APs of controller 2 would then join up to controller 4. Um, as the backup controller. So, some pluses and minuses with this. One, um, you know, con this compared to an HA pairing, uh, we need fewer controllers. So I only need one extra controller to be able to survive an outage. Now I can only survive one controller outage in this instance, um, but I do have to buy less hardware to make this work. Um, the APs will you know, suffer an outage during this process. So eventually, you know, controller two goes out. The APs that were on controller two eventually time out their connection to controller two. And then, uh, so there's that time, the time out par portion, and then the time it takes for the APs to join up to controller four, get provisioned with, um, you know, any iOS or OS changes, as well as uh, get configurations pushed out to them. So that time, clients on those APs are out of luck. So to help with that, anytime we do this HA type stuff, um, ab absolutely in the HA pairing, but even without it, we always wanna be running the same code everywhere. Otherwise, anytime an AP moves from one controller to the other, it's gotta upgrade or downgrade its OS, and that takes a long time. 
Two, we want to make sure our configurations are the same, so all the same WLANs are everywhere, they're configured the same, you know, we should be using the same radius servers on the back end, all that good stuff. Uh, it's going to make things as smooth as possible during these failover processes. So benefits to this, um, yep, we only need one extra controller. Uh, pay attention to licensing. So on older, uh, older code revs, you know, prior to 7.4, this WLC4 had to have at least as many licenses as the biggest controller of 1 through 3. So if for some, let's say that con controller 1 had a 50 license, controller 2 had a 100 license, and controller 3 had a 50 AP license for whatever reason. Controller 4 should have at least 100 licenses. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to back up controller 2 fully. Now, if it does have 100 licenses, technically both controller 1 and 3 could go down, and controller 4 could still pick up the slack. So you have to kind of game your licensing to say, OK, how many controllers am I going to be able to support going down at one time? And that's going to be solely based off of the number of licenses you have on that backup controller. Now, with 7.4 code, you know, we talked about those HA skewed controllers with the HA pairing before. In 7.4, they actually allowed this N plus 1 type model. Um, you could have controller 4 be an HA skewed controller. And that way, you know, if these were 500 license controllers over here, I could just buy an HA skewed controller for, you know, controller 4 here. It doesn't have any licenses. It just allows, you know, pretty much up to maximum licensing, which is 500 on a 5500. And that way it can serve as strictly a backup controller. It couldn't be a primary controller if it's the HA skewed one, but it could definitely be a backup controller um, and you wouldn't have to buy all those excess licenses. So depending on your code revs, uh, you can get away with a cheaper option of this N plus one, you know, once we start talking bigger numbers of licensing by using that HA skew. But prior to that, we have to have enough licenses on controller four here to support failures of, you know, one or more of these controllers uh, on the left-hand side there. But that's kind of the classic model that most people uh, tend to use. Uh, it, it rises the line between, you know, providing full backup for, you know, any controller that goes down, but not costing too much money. You know, if we want to have a one-for-one -one backup, we're basically doubling the cost, um, you know, historically because we'd have to buy double the licensing. Um, so just kind of pay attention to your code rev and, you know, what this is going to mean in terms of costs. Number three, we have an N plus N. So with N plus N, you know, similar kind of concept to the N plus one, except here, um, all controllers are always serving access points at all times. So if we just look at two controller example, And we would have some APs over here on controller one, APs here on controller two. So a real basic example with just two controllers, but what we'd say here is maybe there was, you know, 25 APs on controller one, 25 APs on controller two, but we bought enough licenses to support all APs. So, you know, we bought 50 licenses for each. They're essentially half utilized. So if controller one goes down, all of controller 1's 25 APs go to controller 2. Controller 2 has enough licenses, and it, um, you know, all the APs survive uh, the controller 1 failure. Now, this model, you know, gets a little more tricky as we start adding more and more controllers. So if we had, you know, two more controllers, and four, let's say we wanted to continue to buy you know, 50 licensed controllers. You know, maybe those are 2,500s or whatever it's going to be. Now, what we do is, um, you know, we can control how many eight controllers can fail over just based off of, you know, how much excess licensing do we have. So with this, I technically have purchased 200 licenses. If I want to be able to survive a controller failover, I need to have 50 spare licenses so I just need to make sure that as I divvy up 
my APs across these controllers here, I just leave enough room so that if one goes down, we have enough licenses spread throughout our N plus N design um, so that we can handle it. So we could do something like, you know, 35, 35, 35. And so now I've got, you know, aggregate 140 APs. Oops, APs. I have 200 licenses, so I have 60 excess. So, you know, more than enough. I could, you know, continue to bump this up, you know, higher and higher. You know, if there's 40s, then I'd have, uh, yeah, 40 I think would be the max that I could support uh, and still have a failover. Oh, wait, no, this would be right. Because once I fail over, I would have 140 APs to divvy up across 150 licenses. There, do the math right. So, um, gets a little bit more complex. Now, some benefits of this, uh, you know, we're still paying about the same amount and we still have to buy these excess licenses. We don't get the benefit of just having that backup HA skewed. So once we start talking big license numbers, this option does become more expensive because we're buying excess licenses. Now, if we're running older code, we don't really have any option otherwise anyways. Um, but to me, one other key benefit of this over just an N plus one redundancy is that every controller is, is always in use, which means we're always validating that every controller is operating correctly. If there's a problem on a controller, you know, maybe a misconfig of a WLAN compared to the rest of them, you're gonna know about it, you know, pretty darn quick because we always have clients on every single controller. Now in an N plus one redundancy, one of the key um, weaknesses, I guess I would say, of that one is that we have this controller just stand, sitting by itself and we hope it's configured correctly, but unless we test it, we don't know. So pretty much what happens is if, it's, if there's something wrong there, one of the controllers that was working just fine fails, all the APs move over to it, and now we discover, you know, once these APs move over to the other controller, that something's wrong. You know, it was at a different code rev and we weren't paying attention to so all my APs changed code. Or, you know, something's wrong in the WLAN, or I'm missing a WLAN, or whatever it's going to be. So if you don't have really good config auditing, um, you can run to a point where all of a sudden, during a failure scenario, things are breaking, and then now you have nowhere else to send them. So you're stuck with it until you get that original controller back aligned, or you can figure out and fix what the issue is. So. Um, some benefits and, and negatives for each of these different models here. But that would be the N plus N. And finally, the last one, let's get back to black, is N plus N plus one. And this is really a hybrid of N plus one and N plus N. So it looks like N plus N, but in addition to that, we have yet another controller that's just sitting off by itself. So the idea being that, okay, if N plus N allows one controller to go down, N plus N plus one allows two controllers to go down. So technically it's just adding additional controllers that can fail um, during the process here. So those are the different redundancy models that we have. <clears throat> I typically recommend, you know, if you can, HA pairing is awesome. You know, that's, the, that's pretty much the way to go. Um, especially if you need minimal disruptions due to, to, to failures, you know, if you have a VoIP network or, you know, wireless is very critical to your business processes, you know, you can't go down, at least as much as a wireless network can't go down, you can't go down. Um, HA pairing, that's the one to use. Outside of that, I would either go with an N plus one or an N plus N type model. And it's just going to be based off of, you know, how big is your scope? Uh, what code you're using, you know, for instance, with the N plus one, we can use those HA skewed controllers as your plus one controller to save yourself some money, especially when we start talking very large numbers of licenses. Um, so N plus N plus one, I, honest, I don't know that that's um, as useful, um, but yeah, N plus one, N plus N, HA pairing, whatever kind of makes sense, just based off of your budget and your needs in terms of, um, you know, failovers, you know, how fast is it going to happen, things like that. So those are the different models that we have. 
All right, now how do we actually kind of make this, these different models work? Well, in order for APs to fail over from one controller to another, they have to learn about other controllers to fail over to. Now, if you've seen you know, some of the other V lectures I did, you know, I kind of went through the whole AP discovery process and then the AP join process. So basically, once an AP has joined up to a controller, um, all that stuff that happened during the, the initial discovery when it booted up and learned about a whole bunch of different controllers that it could join up to, and then it finally did join up to a controller, all those controllers that dynamically learn, you know, DHP option 43 or DNS or, you know, layer 3 broadcast, things like that, those go out the window. You know, the AP pretty much just forgets about those and starts fresh with a new list of controllers that it can use for failover purposes, you know, once it has joined up to a different, to a controller. Now, um, what are those different methods we have to learn about failover controllers since we've forgotten all that dynamically learned stuff um, from the discovery process. And also, uh, you know, another note, failover technically, um, what we're trying to do is teach the APs, other controllers to learn uh, before it has to essentially totally give up and start the discovery process all over again. So we're trying to prevent um, you know, essentially the AP from starting from square one like it just booted up. So. The different ways we have to, um, uh, to learn about these failover controllers. So failover controller discovery. So we have three main methods of telling APs about other controllers to fail over to. Number one, and this one actually kind of goes back to the discovery phase. Uh, it's a dual purpose method, and that is with a static primary, secondary, tertiary controller configuration. Uh, and that is per AP. So on, the, on every individual AP, you can configure a primary controller, a secondary controller, and a tertiary controller. Now, these controllers are remembered uh, forever un, until you wipe out the AP's uh, memory. So, it survives reboots, it survives moving from one controller to another, it stays with the AP. So um, this method is honestly one of the, the primary methods that we should, that we use, or at least I always use, to have my APs know of other controllers to fail over to. And the way that we would configure that, let's actually get on to some controllers now. All right, so I have uh, four different controllers. AP is kind of spread all over. So for instance, LAP1 is on controller one right now. So you would go into the controller, or sorry, into the access point, and I guess if I went too fast, it's on the wireless menu up on top. And we automatically get this AP list, but otherwise this would be the all APs link on the left-hand side here. Click into your individual AP, go to the high availability tab, and here's our primary, secondary, tertiary config. So I could say WLC1 is my primary, so I give it the name and IP address. Now technically the IP address is optional, but I would always put this in. Old, old, old code, you didn't actually get the IP address option, um, but I would, uh, on any code that you should be running today, put the IP address in. And this is the management IP address. And then I could say WLC2, is my secondary, and WLC4 is my tertiary. So now this AP knows three different controllers to possibly fail over to. Now it's currently on one, so it knows two additional controllers to fail over to. And that'll stay with the AP until I wipe out its configuration, which uh, is something I would explicitly have to do. It wouldn't happen accidentally or anything like that. So that's method number one. Method number two is we can have a backup primary and secondary controllers. And it's globally, oh, let's call it global per controller. So every single controller 
can be configured with a global backup primary and backup secondary controller. So that any AP that joins to a controller with this configured will learn about two, you know, up to two different controllers to possibly fail over two. So where is this configured? If we go to uh, wireless on top, and then on the left side under access points, global configuration. It's going to be over on the right hand side here. So we have this backup primary, both IP and name. Again, I would put both of them in. So we'll go ahead and say WL, I'm on controller one, so I'll say oh, IP address 10.10.112. So controller two. And controller four is my backup secondary. and apply. So once I configure this, any access point that joins controller 1 is going to dynamically learn about WLC2 and WLC4 as options to fail over to if it ever loses its connection to wireless LAN controller 1. Now this is a dynamic um, advertisement to, to the APs. When the AP actually fails over to one of these guys, anytime an AP um, joins up to a new controller, it relearns these two values. So if it joined, you know, right now it knows two of them, but let's say it, it failed over to controller two. If I don't configure anything on controller two for a backup primary, backup secondary, then when the AP joins controller two, it's going to forget about um, these two that it learned from controller one. When controller two pushes out its configuration to the AP, uh, the AP will just not have a, a backup primary, backup secondary learned anymore. So every single time an AP joins a controller, these values are overwritten based off of what's configured on the controller that it just joined up to. Okay, so globally per controller, learned, every, learned new every single time an AP joins up to a controller. So this will not be remembered uh, across controller joins, it won't be remembered across reboots. Um, this is just kind of a one-time shot. Uh, once it joins up to a controller, it learns about that. All right, last method we have to learn about other controllers. And this is through mobility group membership. And this is, um, technically it's per controller, but it's usually more per um, mobility group since most every controller in the mobility group are configuring each other as mobility group members. So how does this one work? If I go back to my controllers here. So every controller is a member of some mobility group name. So you might see it referred to as different. Oftentimes people think of the group name um, but in the, or think of it referenced as the group name. So in a, uh, this is WLC1 as the name. In the GUI, you see it's actually referenced as the domain name. Uh, just depending on where you read, uh, I, you see it referred to as both as domain name, group name. Basically, if it's a name, this is what we're talking about. So typically when we want controllers to work together in terms of having uh, clients roam from APs on controller one to controller two, we add them into each other's mobility group list. So if we go from controller on top, on the left hand side, mobility management, mobility groups, here's controller one's mobility group list. At the moment, it's just itself in there. Now if I want, I can start adding other controllers into here. And this is how we're going to be able to advertise additional controllers to our APs. Now the requirement though is that I'm only going to advertise other controllers in my mobility group list as long as they share the same group name. Now I can have you know, other controllers in the list with the same group name, different group name. It doesn't matter in terms of roaming. We can still allow roaming between controllers that use different group names as long as they're in each other's list, and that works fine. But uh, in terms of advertising these controllers to other APs, they do have to use the same group name. So let's go ahead and get controller two working uh, in this fashion. First, let's see what controller two is using for its group name. So I'll go to controller and under general, we see it's using WLC two. 
So I just need to give them the same. So I'll just say its group name is WLC1. So then it matches up with controller ones. And then we need to add them into each other's mobility group list. So I like the edit all option, but there's a few different ways to do it. Basically, we just need to call out each other's MAC address, management IP address, and group name. And just make sure that we have it added on both sides. I could also add these onesie twosies uh, at a time and with the new button, and then I could just type it in each individual box. Uh, it's a little bit more work, so I like the kind of copy paste method. Okay, so now I have controller two and it's using the same group name. Now any APs on controller one, we'll learn about controller two as possible uh, failover options. If I added in, say I added in controller four, uh, we'll do this just for illustrative purposes here. So controller four is in group WLC four. Let's leave that in WLC four so we can kind of see how it differentiates between same group name, different group name. So again, we'll go into mobility groups and I'm going to add controller four to controller one and controller one to controller four because we always you know, need to add them in uh, both directions here. So I'll take controller one, put it into controller four and controller four and put it into controller one. Now it typically takes a little bit of time for the stats to come up, but honestly in terms of this AP failover process, it never even needs to come up. Just the fact that it's on the list would actually allow it to advertise it to the AP. So these are the different ways we have to configure it. How can we verify that the AP actually is learning these different methods? Well, the easiest way for that is to actually get into the console or the CLI of the AP itself and we can see some good show commands there. At least that's typically the way I've done it. So if I go to AP, let's see, what APs do I have on controller one first? And we'll check that. Okay, so let's go to LAP one and see what we see there. All right, login, Cisco, Cisco, is the default username, password, capital C on both. Okay, so two of these methods can be verified with the show, capwap, client, config. So these static primary, secondary, tertiary entries are these MWAR name, MWAR IP address entries here. So uh, primary, secondary, tertiary. So we can see um, the verification of what I s configured in the GUI. This is an easy one to validate in the GUI itself as well. You just go into the AP and go to that high availability tab. You'll see the same information here. The other one's um, not so easy. So if I keep scrolling down, I'll get just before uh, it starts talking about the interfaces, uh, a list of configured switches. So it's always going to have at least one on there and that's the controller that's currently on. But this is where we're going to see any other controllers um, with that mobility group advertisement method. So here I see, um, here's controller one, which is the one that's on. It learned about controller two because controller two uses the same mobility group name. Now I also had controller four but we use a different group name. So we see I did not learn controller four. So that can becomes kind of an important thing as we configure our controllers um, and we are picking those mobility group names, you know, keep this in mind that if I use the same names, I could have APs failing over between this. Now, maybe that's good, maybe that's not. When would be an instance where that's not good? Well, here's something I actually saw at a customer site one time. Very simple design, they had an internal WLC, just a single controller. All the APs were on that. But the internal controller was tunneled up to a DMZ controller for guest connectivity. Classic design, but they happened to use the same mobility group name. So what happened was they wanted to do an upgrade of you know, the internal controller. So during the upgrade process, it reboots. The APs drop their connection, look for another controller to join up to, and they said, oh, 
we have this DMZ controller that we learned about through Mobility Group uh, membership. So, you know, a bunch of APs joined up to the DMZ, and when the internal controller came back, they didn't do anything else, else special to make the APs flow back, so all of a sudden, they just had a whole bunch of APs stuck on the DMZ controller. And what happened was, so, you know, this guy had just 12 licenses, this is a 5508, 12 licenses, we don't need that many. Let's say that this one had 50, I can't remember the exact number. So what would happen is that, you know, we'd reboot the AP, they would reboot the APs. Um, the APs would remember the controller that they were on before. And they would learn about the, the internal controller as well. And what's the tiebreaker when we have two different controllers and, you know, they're not doing any primary, secondary, tertiary, they're not doing master controller mode. Well, it's the least loaded controller, so all of a sudden the DMZ controller was the least loaded controller because the internal controller had a bunch of APs on it. And so we kept getting APs going back to that DMZ controller. So, you know, that's a, just a good example as, you know, what we name our mobility groups matter. So you might think, well, why don't I just name all my mobility groups different everywhere if I, wanted, if I don't want to use this method? Well, sometimes we have to name it the same and usually the main reason we would ever have to name them the same is for CCK and fast roaming. With CCK and fast roaming, when we add controllers to each other's mobility group list, CCK and fast roaming only works between controllers on that list with the same name. So um, anytime we need to do CCKM, there's no way around, uh, around it. APs will learn about you know, these other controllers to fail over to. But we have many methods to control you know, deterministically how the failover should happen. And we'll get to that in just uh, a short second. So there's a verification of the stack, primary, secondary, tertiary. There's a verification of what we've learned through mobility group membership options. And the last one, uh, number two there, the backup primary, backup secondary, that one you can see on the AP, if I get back to it, through the show capwap client HA command. And here is the backup primary, backup secondary. The IP address is converted into hex. So this is a hex equivalent of, excuse me, 10, 10, 2, 10, sorry, 10, 10, 1, 12, 10, and 10, 10, 1, 12, 20. Not sure why they do that, but that's how they did it. And we also see the, the name as well. So that's how we can validate that indeed an access point actually did learn about this backup primary, backup secondary controllers. Okay, so we have these different methods. Now my APs, you know, have multiple different ways to know about other controllers to fail over to in the event that their currently connected controller fails. How can we control, you know, a priority of, okay, if I lose connection to my current controller, this is the one I want to fail over to next, and then this one, and on down the line. So, basically, each of these three methods has a priority to it, and the priority is pretty much as I list it here. So, um, highest priority always goes to a statically configured primary, secondary, tertiary controller directly configured on the AP itself. So if I'm on my primary controller and that one goes away, I'm gonna try to join up to my secondary controller next. If that one's unavailable, then I'll try to go on to the tertiary controller. So that's always top of the hill. Next is the backup primary, backup secondary. So if I don't have any hard-coded primary, secondary, tertiary controllers, or they're just all unavailable, then I'm going to try to first join the backup primary controller globally configured on the controller I guess I technically was previously joined to, and then the secondary. If that's not configured or neither of those are available, then lastly I'm going to attempt to join um, you know, one of the controllers in this mobility group membership list. And if we want deterministic failover, we never want to make our way down to um, option number three there. We always want to rely on either option one and possibly option two. Now my recommendation is pretty much everything should use hard-coded primary, secondary, tertiary controllers or just primary, secondary, just depending on how many controllers you have. Um, that way we always, always know what the order is in terms of our failover and we, we control it. It doesn't matter where the control where the AP currently is, it always has the same hierarchy in terms of where it wants to be, what's the next priority, and what's the next priority after that. 
because typically what we want to avoid is, you know, normally we want to avoid kind of salt pepper style um, AP deployments where we have, you know, 100 APs on a floor of a building and they're all mixed up between five different controllers. We don't want that because every single time someone's walking around, we're having inter-controller roams left and right and that's, you know, not ideal from a performance standpoint. Typically we want, you know, all the APs on a given floor to be on one single controller. And the only way to control that really is with primary, secondary, tertiary uh, static assignments on the AP. Now, if you want, you know, the backup primary, backup secondary, that can be a worthwhile play. Let's say you only had two controllers. And so you could have a design where on WLC1, you configure a backup pry of WLC2. And then on WLC2, you configure a backup pri primary controller of WLC1. So any APs that join controller one will learn about controller two as their backup primary. If they fail over to controller two, they learn about controller one as their backup primary so that you know eventually controller one comes back online. If controller two goes away, they'll flow back over to controller one. So, <coughs> excuse me. That's a real easy way in just a two controller environment. If you didn't want to have to do per AP static configurations or anything like that, um, you know, if you just have pairs of controllers you want failing over back and forth between, that's a really easy way to configure it. Um, and you might just, you know, do the same thing if we had four controllers. Essentially, we just deploy them in sort of high availability pairs, but not actually doing the HA pairing feature. Um, APs are just flowing back and forth between pairs of controllers. Um, backup primary, backup secondary would be a great way uh, to do that. But my personal preference, again, primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, static configurations. That way I always know if controller one's not down, my APs are going to be on controller two. You know, if it, what, it goes from controller one to controller two to controller three, you know, that's the progression. So I always know exactly where the APs are, are going to be. And, um, you know, the APs are always staying clustered with each other. So that way I'm avoiding, you know, as much as possible, the salt pepper type deployments and uh, lots of intercontroller roams, things like that. Okay. So that's how we can control the progression of failover in terms of priority, you know, deterministic fail, failing over to less and less um, desirable controllers. But typically, you know, if we have this, you know, for instance, controller one goes down, everyone moves over to controller two. Generally, if I'm trying to be real deterministic about things, once controller one comes back up, I want my APs that were there to get back to it. Otherwise, then controller one is just sitting there and no AP will ever join up to it until, you know, APs reboot or controller two goes down or, you know, something happens that kicks the APs off of the controller that they were currently on. So if I want that, the APs to proactively get back to, you know, a more preferred um, controller, then my only option with that is hard-coded primary, secondary, tertiary controllers. Um, no other option will allow me to fail back to a more preferred controller. I can only fail down to, you know, progressively less and less preferred controllers with my backup primary, secondary, with my mobility group um, advertised uh, controllers. Static primary, secondary, tertiary is the only way to get back to a more preferred controller. Now, in order for this to work, this process of failing from a less control preferred controller to a more preferred controller is referred to as AP fallback. So in order to make this work, the controllers all need to have this AP fallback fe feature turned on. So let's show you where that is. Good news is it's turned on by default, but you never know. Sometimes stuff gets turned off. So if you go to the controller general configuration, AP fallback, make sure that it's enabled. If you disable it, what that means is that 
you know, I'm on controller one right now. So if I disable it on controller one, any APs currently on controller one will never be able to leave controller one to go to a more preferred controller. So whatever controller they're on, they're stuck there until they reboot, the controller fails, you know, some other event that kicks them off of the controller. They can't preemptively leave the controller of their own volition. So generally just make sure that this is turned on everywhere. But if, if it does accidentally get turned off, that's sort of the scope of the feature. Um, it only affects APs currently associated to the controller that is on. It wouldn't prevent other, you know, if WLC1 was the more preferred controller of an AP on controller two, um, even if I have it turned off on controller one, controller two AP could move to controller one. It's just you can't move off of controller one to a more preferred controller. So um, the AP fallback feature, definitely make sure that you have that turned on. Some other rules in terms of moving from a less preferred controller to a more preferred controller. I can move from an, any unconfigured controller to any configured controller. Now, what that means is a configured controller is a primary, secondary, tertiary controller configured on the AP itself. So if I failed all the way down to, you know, like a backup primary, backup secondary, or one of these mobility group uh, advertised controllers, I can move up to a primary, my secondary, or my tertiary, whichever one becomes available first, I'll move over to that one. Once I'm on a configured controller, I will only ever move up to the primary controller. And the only time this really comes into play is if I'm on the tertiary controller and my secondary controller becomes available, I will not move from a tertiary to a secondary. I will only move from the tertiary all the way up to my primary once that primary comes back. And the idea there is just to prevent too many um, controller uh, moves because that is disruptive to the clients. When an AP moves from one controller to another, it essentially stops serving all clients, associates up to the new controller, the new controller pushes out its config to the access point. At that point, then the access point can start serving clients again. But it's disruptive, it has to kick off all clients. So to prevent that happening too many times, um, we will only move from tertiary to primary, not tertiary to secondary to primary. So. Um, those are kind of the rules in terms of getting back onto a more preferred controller. Uh, one other feature that we'll talk about here um, with this whole high availability thing is going to be um, AP priority. So let's say that you know we're failing stuff over and I didn't buy enough licenses um, for everything. So I can't support you know every AP you know failing over between controller one to controller two. Let's just draw this out so you can kind of see it visually. So let's say I had two controllers servicing clients and then I had a backup controller sitting over here. Let's say I bought 50 licenses on the backup controller, controller one, and we have 100 on controller one, controller two, and everything's fully maxed out on these guys. So if controller one goes down, I have 100 APs fa failing over to controller three. I can only support 50 of them. So 50 APs are out of luck. Now under normal circumstances, it's just gonna be the first 50 APs that join up to controller three are A-OK -okay, and the rest of the 50, tough luck, you should have been faster. Well, it's, you know, that might not be very desirable. Maybe I have APs in specific locations in my building that are very critical. You know, so I always want them up um, as opposed to others, you know, if I don't have enough licenses for everyone, some are going to be more important than others. That's where we can say, okay, certain APs are higher priority than other APs. So that if I have, I'm full up, you know, controller three is full up with 50 APs and a new AP says, hey, I want to join. Um, it can say, I'm a high priority AP. WLC three can see, okay, do I have any lower priority APs? Yep. Boom, I'm gonna kick off one of the lower priority ones, allow this higher priority AP to join. So this feature is turned off by default. Uh, to configure it, it's gonna be under wireless, global configuration, 
same place we were doing the backup primary secondaries. And the global AP failover priority. So once I turn this on, hit apply. Now, if you know, I did this on controller one, if controller one is full up and it receives a higher priority join request, it can kick off a lower priority AP. Okay, so how do we configure this priority on the APs? It's going to be a per AP configuration. And it's going to be under the high availability tab, same place we configured that primary, secondary, tertiary. Everything starts off at a low priority by default. So we can see we have low, medium, high, critical. The, higher, you know, the further down the list you go, the higher the priority is. Um, one thing that automatically gets a critical priority if you ever put uh, an AP in mesh mode, it automatically inherits a critical priority. So we always have mesh APs you know, at the top of the food chain automatically. You don't have to do anything special for those mesh APs. So you would have to do this on a per AP basis. You know, say this one's high over and over and over through all of my access points. So uh, failover priority. One last setting we'll kind of talk about uh, to kind of round out the discussion here is timers. So, you know, how does an AP know when it needs to fail over from controller one to controller two? You know, how does it know that controller one went away and it's no longer, you know, there? Well, it's going to be with, you know, a heartbeat. So the AP is sending a heartbeat to the controller on a regular basis. If the controller stops responding to those heartbeats, it knows something went wrong and it's time to, to move on to a different controller. So by default, we have 30 second heartbeat timers. Uh, if we want, we can manipulate these. We also have um, a newer feature is fast heartbeat timers. So we can enable these for both either local mode or atrium mode. So I could say local mode APs, you know, one second. So faster failure detection, of course, you know, just make sure that you don't put it too low, especially if you're going, you know, across like a WAN or something like that, that might be inducing some latency or you might have to suffer a couple, a uh, little bit of packet loss. Um, but definitely if it's just going across a LAN, you know, one second probably would be fine. So this is how we can, you know, determine, you know, how fast of a failover are we going to get just by these heartbeat timers. Most of the time, unless things are super critical, you know, a lot of people just leave the 30 second timer on there. Um, because in addition to that, we have the, the join process and configuration. So, um, unless you're doing HA pairing, there's really nothing super fast about uh, wireless failovers. Even when we are dropping these, these timers down, there's still going to be a noticeable outage to the clients. And once you'd have a noticeable outage is a 10 second outage compared to a 40 second outage. Is it that big of a deal? Nah, I guess certain customers would say yes, some say no, but this is how we can kind of control um, how long it takes to detect that there's been a failure on the controller. Okay, so we've seen you know, a lot of these configurations. A lot of the configurations that I recommend kind of stem around using these you know, primary, secondary, tertiary, hard configured um, settings on the APs. One hurdle to doing that is that we have to go into every single access point and configure it on a per AP basis. So if you were to pretend that I had 500 APs on here, going into, okay, here's an AP, high availability, type all this stuff in, hit apply, go back to the list, find the next AP, and these are in a massive unsorted list, so I have to scroll down and try to remember, okay, what was the last one I did? It's a mess. So we need a better method to get these you know, primary, secondary, tertiary configs out to all my APs, and then what happens if I need to change it later? So there's two decent ways, I would say, of addressing this problem once we start scaling to some larger numbers. One, uh, use the CLI of your controller. So you could go into one of your controllers. I'll open up controller one here. And you would do the line of config. Let's see if I can find it. Config, AP, and let's see. So primary base, secondary base, tertiary base to configure it. So if we want to configure all three, it would take three lines of config per AP. Primary base, and then the name, 
and what the name of my AP is. So LAP1, and then finally, optionally, the IP address. So obviously, if I was just typing this in, you know, you're saying, "Well, this isn't any better." So what you would do is you would, you know, basically just use some um, spreadsheet magic or a little bit of scripting magic, dump the output of a show AP summary, copy all the AP names, and basically shove those into the CLI config. If you can use a little bit of scripting or a little bit of you know regex matching magic or something like that, um, you know Excel, you know, working with Excel might be a, a way to do this. You can get the output of the CLI and then just copy it, paste it into the CLI, and that's a decent way to do it if you have no other option. But if you have something like Prime or WCS, you know whatever the, the Cisco management platform that you're using. Um, that's the way to go. Let's go ahead and take a look at how we can do it in that. So if I go into WCS, let's get logged in. What we want to use is a lightweight AP configuration template. Some of you may be familiar with the controller configuration templates, um, but we also have configuration templates for the, the lightweight APs themselves. And they're actually very powerful, much more so than the controller configuration templates, in my opinion. So to get to it, we would go to Configure, AP Configuration Templates, Lightweight AP, obviously in Prime. Be a little bit different method to get to it. But once you get there and you add a template, the look feel is going to be the same between WCS and Prime. Um, give it a name, call mine Price Sector. And then basically this is just about anything you could possibly configure on a lightweight AP you're going to see in here. So basically any setting you want to push out, you just find it, check its box, and then go ahead and put in the value. So here I could say controller 1, controller 2, controller 4 for my uh, primary, secondary, tertiary. And I also want to get the IPs in there. That's in a little different section. So Here's the IP, it's telling you that this is only supported since controller version 6, so yeah, we'll just ignore these since I am using newer code. All right, fine, I'll type it in first. And then I'll type the IPs associated with the controllers, 10.10.111.10. 10, there we go. And we can save the template. And if I want to apply it, all I need to do is select my APs. So I can select all APs um, you know, by controller. So I could target uh, all the APs on a specific controller. So if I said WLC1, search, here's all the APs on controller 1. So very easily targeting you know, specific controllers. Um, I could target, you know, if I have maps and different things like that, I can target it um, by floor areas, lots of different things. But let's just go ahead and I'll just shoot it out to all five of the APs that I have across all of my controllers here. Apply. There it is, just configured all five in you know just a single second there. Now if I go to some of my other APs like LAP3, I'll see it on there. There we go. And now that I have it configured, as long as I have you know, AP fallback enabled in all these places, I should actually start seeing all my APs flow over to wireless LAN controller one. So controller three, I see two APs there. Go to the high availability tab. There they are. So very, very easy to configure this primary, secondary, tertiary across all of your APs or a specific subset of your APs. Um, very powerful tool in my opinion. So um, one of the, to me, one of my favorite tools um, in WCS or Prime were actually the lightweight configuration templates because I could do this across a massive amount of APs um, with very little work. And then this becomes really easy. So let's say I wanted to uh, 
I wanted to do an upgrade on controller one, but I didn't want to suffer, you know, the failover timers or things like that. So I could preemptively configure all the APs on controller one uh, to prefer, you know, controller two. And they would just on their own move over there. And once they're all over, I could uh, do whatever I needed in controller one. So it's a little bit less disruptive that way. Let's see if we have anything failing over yet or preemptively moving over. Okay, yep. Four and five have preemptively moved over. That's because I had that AP fallback enabled. So from their mind, uh, four and five were actually moving from an unconfigured controller to a configured controller because uh, they were on controller three. Now the AP on controller four, oh, maybe that already moved. That was moving from the tertiary controller over to the primary controller, so that was just fine. It didn't, you know, if this was down, it would not have moved to controller two because it won't go from tertiary to secondary, but it will go from tertiary to primary. So there's an example of, you know, in action, how to get controllers or APs um, to always be on a specific controller if that controller is available. And usually that's the, the function that, or the behavior that I want to be seeing in my environments. So there we have it. Um, High availability with the wireless LAN controllers. We talked about the different high availability models from HA pairing, N plus one, N plus N. Um, how do we advertise uh, different controllers to fail over to, to our APs with the primary, secondary, tertiary, backup primary, backup secondary, and our mobility group advertisements. You know, how we can control um, you know, the priority of the failover process and you know, getting controller, or APs to move back to more preferred controllers um, as well as a few of the other just miscellaneous uh, configs that go along with HA. So thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll hopefully see you next time on our next V-Lecture.